It never is, is it? <laughs> it's not that <laughs> I got water in my nose. Hey guys, it's Christy and welcome to my Aruba vlog. So a couple of months ago, the guys at Casino Aruba reached out to me and invited me and they were like, do you want to come to the very first WSOPC in Aruba? And I was like, does a bear shit in the woods? I didn't say that. I thought that. But what I was really thinking is, uh, crystal clear water and 80 degrees in November? Are my friends coming? Gary Gates, WSOP main event final tableist, and Ronnie Barda, this season's contestant on Survivor? And also, do I want a chance at some hardware? Yeah, for sure. Where are you going, bro? I can still see you. You're not that camouflage. Look at me, on my way to the tournament area, I'm talking shit to an iguana. Yeah, I walked straight into that tournament and uh, fired off two bullets. Barely made late reg, so uh, that didn't go as planned. However, Gary mother effing Gates made the final table. He demolished heads up to win his very first ring. Are you taking my job? God oh, damn it, Ronnie Barta. One more circuit yeah. ring than Ronnie Barta has. Oh, damn, shots <laughs> fired. Uh, I'm gonna have to come after more rings in the next few days. It's fucked up. And the very next day, Andrew came off the plane. Look who's here. What's up, baby girl? We're here. And we're gambling. We stepped off the airplane with no sleep. You know, gamblers gotta gamble. And you already called someone with Jack High and it was good. Yeah, and then he called me an idiot. Hey. I was just telling him about the Jack High hand. You want to tell him about it? Sure. Just full me on the button. I raised with, I think it was like a pretty bad hand, like a Jack 4 offsuit. And just a min raise. Only the big blind calls. And the flop was 9 7 deuce. And checks to me, I'm going to bet this flop a lot versus a big blind defend. Just kind of go from there. Bet small, he calls. And the turn was an ace, so it's a pretty good card for me to keep bluffing. I didn't really think I needed to bet too big here. I also wanted to kind of like manage his stack size a little bit because um, I didn't want to like inflate the pot too much in a spot where I thought he'd he'd play pretty straightforward. Uh, I bet he calls, but he calls really quickly. So I'm like, hmm, this seems kind of weird. This doesn't feel like, this doesn't feel like he has an ace. This is like a draw or like maybe a pair on the flop or something. Yeah, when people have good hands, they like pause and think about racing, even for a second. Yeah, or like, you know, typically the, the, the quick nature is, is like a weakness tell. Mm -hmm. And like, it can be like sophisticated opponents can, can do that sometimes to throw you off, but it's pretty infrequent, so. Yeah, or a draw. Yeah, so the river is a, is a nine. So it pairs the, the top card on the flop and then he thinks for a while and then he bets like almost the size of the pot, which was around half his stack. Given like the size of my race preflop, I just figured that he had like all the eight six all the 10-8 offsuit combinations. I just figured that like, given like how I saw this guy play, you know, the sizing that he used on the river too, it just felt really like he was trying to make me fold. Like he, he just, he wasn't really consistent with how I'd seen him playing like a lot of his value hands. I just decided to call. I was like, all right, well, and I was like, I don't know how much. And I called and he goes, <laughs> he's like, you got it. And he flips over 10-8. I was like, oh, I got, Jack high. I was like, you know how those go, like, you look like an idiot if you're wrong. And he goes, you still look like an idiot. Nice! Yes, got him. Yes. What do you think, Dallas? Did we get him? Did we get him, Dallas? Did we get him? Andrew went deep and he cashed in 17th place. And it was like, it was so amazing for all my friends because Ronnie Barda made the final table of the first event, then Gary won the ring, and then my husband cashed. And then I needed to express my feelings, so I did it the best way I know how, really, which is obviously through gifts. I'm having so much fun, I don't even care about cashing. I feel so determined with just a couple of events left to just play my best and then whatever happens, happens. So the very next event, event number eight, a $400 buy-in no limit tournament. I go deep, played super hard, accumulated lots of chips, and then we got down to the final 10 players. We combined to one and I got into this 
big pot with one of the best players left. So he raises under the gun. The blinds are 4,000, 8,000 with the big blind Annie of 8,000. And he raises under the gun or under the gun plus one to 20,000. Excuse me because I might be getting the bet sizes a little bit off here, but for the purposes of this hand, it'll be accurate enough. I am in the cutoff with pocket nines. Now, whenever you are in a tournament, this is something that I had to train myself to do. You always wanna ask yourself, who is this player? What position are they in? And what are the stack sizes? Those three things will help you dictate and decide on the best action moving forward. But if you miss one of those, which is really easy to do, it can lead you astray. So who is this guy? He is one of the better players. And what is his position? So he is in very early position. And what are his, his stack size? So we are both pretty deep, 30, 35 big blinds for the rest of the field because everybody is around like, you know, 20 big blinds. And since he's a good player, that means he has a pretty defined range in early position, meaning lots of good hands, middle to large pairs, suited broadways. So do I wanna go broke with pocket nines if I three bet and he four bets? And no. Nines is probably the line, tens is probably the line. I could flat ten sometimes, three bet sometimes, but nines I pretty much wanna call. So we're heads up to the flop, and the flop is ace, ten, nine. Rainbow, and he C bets. I think around twenty to twenty-two thousand, and I decide to just call. The turn is a jack, bringing a backdoor flush draw. So it's interesting because our ranges, our our strength of hands are pretty similar. The only hand that I don't really have is jacks and aces that he could possibly have. So I could have jack 10 suited, he could have jack 10 suited, I could have ace 10 suited, so could he. Um, so we're fairly, you know, we're doing, we're both doing decent on this flop. But when he checks, that pretty much caps him because he's not gonna, he's not gonna check aces on this board that's getting scarier. He's not gonna check tens, nines. I mean, I have nines, but, or when he turns a jack. I don't think he's, when he has king queen suited, I don't think he's gonna check that because there's a backdoor flush draw. Plus this card is pretty good for my range. He wants to make the pot big. So when he checks, he's capped. So when he checks and he caps himself, I decide to go for a larger bet size, which I would with, me, with, with many of my good hands and also my bluffs. So if I had like queen jack, you know, that I had called the flop with like a backdoor flush draw, or if I have, um, you know, king 10 with a backdoor flush draw that I called on the flop, then I would bet fairly big as well. So I bet 85,000 and he tanks. He tanks for a while and then he decides to jam for around 240K. So about three times what I bet. And of course I call and he has ace king. So I definitely see what he was thinking. You know, if I turned more equity that he wants to get the money in and also he has a king in his hand and a box king queen. And so I definitely get why he did that. So once he's eliminated, we got the final official table of nine and I have the momentum. You guys, I was wearing my favorite t-shirt channel in my inner Lizzo. Like, you can win, but like, <laughs> It's gonna cost you more yeah. to litigate this than what's brutal. Like, but that's how they make money. They go around and make money. They see people and they get. And you guys know a while back I made a video blog about how I was kind of upset that I chopped and I didn't get the experience of the final table. Oh no, this time I was like, no deal. So I'm knocking players out and then we get three handed. And the dynamic is pretty interesting because I have a lot of chips, so does the gentleman to my left, whose name is Clyde. He is one of the co-owners of Kojaks in Midland, Texas. Really cool. We're gonna talk about Clyde in a minute, but then then another gentleman who's short stacked. And, and then there was a point where he went all in for I think around 10 big blinds, and I was in the small blind with ace eight off. You know, this is one of those spots where I think a lot of times people have 
trouble calling correctly to shoves. And so I wanted to bring it back to those three things that I said before. Like, think about the player. Okay, what kinds of hands is he going to shove on the button? Especially with 10 big blinds and in this spot. And he's gonna shove every pair, every worst ace, every suited king, queen, jack, any suited connector. And just ace high is doing way better than those hands. So I just wanna encourage people to think about that because some, because one of the biggest mistakes that, um, that players make who aren't pros in tournaments is they don't call off wide enough. So you wanna think about those things. Also, another thing was, I just paused for a second. This is also something you can do because you because you often worry about someone waking up with a hand behind you. So I just paused and looked to my left. Clyde looked super disinterested. And as soon as I called, he because he just like completely mugged. So, little trick for you. So he had king high, ran out, I flopped an ace. And then I got heads up. Guys, this is what I came here for. I wanted to win that ring. Ugh. And they put it right on the table between us, just looking at us. And I crumbled. So in the heat of the battle, I didn't really know what was going on with me at the time. All I knew was that I was struggling, he was winning a lot of small pots, and I was losing my footing. I, I was just not adjusting well because the way I would played with him earlier was like, all you had to do was make a slightly better hand than him and he would put in all the money. But in heads up, it's hard to make a hand and I was getting such shit cards. I was never making a pair and I just kept folding and folding and losing. And I did not adjust well. I got whittled down and finally did make a hand where I flopped a straight and he had 9-4 top pair on a 9-6-5 board and we got it all in and I had 7-8 and won and doubled up and then we battled, battled, battled again and I could just feel myself sweating and freaking out and like I was so stressed and then all of my friends were there watching the final table. I just didn't adjust and he whittled me down again. And, and then I was like, well, if I'm not making hands, I need to be bluffing more. So this hand comes up, re raises on the button minimum, which was so to 25,000 to 50,000. And then I three bet and make it 100,000 more. Sometimes out of position, I would make it four times the raise, but because we are pretty shallow, I, I just made it 100,000 more and he called. Then the flop was 10 of diamonds, three of diamonds, five. And I have ace three with the ace of diamonds. In the heat of the moment, again, I was just, I was having a really hard time focusing because I wanted to win so bad. The pot was around 300,000 and each of us had around three or 400,000 behind. So I was like, should I bet small and shove the turn? Or should I just shove here, get some momentum? You know, he's just calling three bets so wide, he probably whiffed, plus I have back doors and a pair. So I just shoved and he called with 9-10 offsuit. To be honest with you, I was pretty devastated. <laughs> I just I wanted to win so bad, which is part of the problem. Here's a little clip of the next morning. It's crazy how fast it shifted. As soon as I realized how bad I wanted it, it threw me into the unhealthy expression of the competitive part of me, which is that like, I need the win to mean something about me, to validate who I am to not be embarrassed in front of my friends. So it became this negative thing where I was like playing not to lose. And I, I got, I basically just, I, I got ran over and then I made some plays with emotion instead of even knowing how many big blinds I had. I just wanted to say, first of all, that um, I'm so proud of you and I love you so much. I obviously, I, you know, want you to win and want you to be happy. But I was reflecting this morning and I was thinking about it and 
I feel like in many ways it's kind of kind of perfect that it happened the way that it did. I think having lost the match and lost the ring and the prestige or whatever of winning a tournament you know you get to look at it from like a healthy perspective and, and think you know who you want to be as a human and as a poker player is someone that is removed from the results and the meaning of things and in poker especially it's very important to just approach every situation as it unfolds like what's the best possible decision in this moment where's the EV and you always focus on that and the second that your mind goes somewhere else to some, you know, expectation, some result, some prize, it's a distraction. And in this case, it turned to be your undoing. But again, you know, you had never been there before. This was really good experience for you. You guys were a good rail. And good game, Clyde. Okay, now let's go crush this main. Let's go do it. First, I gotta take a shot. I used to do, be competitive about tequila shots. Now I'm all about weak grass shots. Oh, you really threw that down. Get out of here. We go straight into the WSO PC $1,700 buy-in main event. And I feel like I just carried all the momentum through because I chipped up really nicely. Finished the day with maybe around 300,000, which was an excellent stack. And it also meant that I did not have to play day 1B and I got the day off, which was amazing because in the morning, Mark Charlie of Casino Aruba, he took us to see the flamingos, it was so fun. We went snorkeling, we saw peacocks, and I got to take the rest of the day off while everyone else had to go play day 1B. Now, when they finished the night, we were actually only three players away from the money. So when day 1A and B combined, those who were left for day two, we only had to lose three more until we were in the money. And Andrew made it to day two, Gary made it to day two, it was so interesting because I was walking in feeling like, oh, I just hope the bubble breaks fast, then we can all be in the money and we'll all be happy. Uh, I had to check myself because if you want to be a really good poker player and competitor, you have to love this part. Love the pressure. Love this part where you watch people squirm, right? Yeah, the tension, all the all the pressure, all that stuff is like, that's what I remember, that's what I live for, I love that. It's like it's an aliveness to it. Yeah. On break, I think there's about 25 players left and I just lost a huge pot. I raised on the button with queen five suited and the big blind defended and we'd just gotten these new players. Never seen him before, don't know how he plays. Um, the flop was 10-9 rag, one diamond. So I have backdoor straight draw, backdoor flush draw and I um, I see bet he called, the turn is a king of diamonds, so now I have a straight draw and a flush draw. Um, and I bet I bet again, um, and he raised, and I called, and I broke the river, and folded to a pretty big bet by him, but um, the mistake I made was, first of all, I think that in a tournament like this, where there are, you know, very different levels of skill. I think I should keep the pot small until I have a better feel for who the players are. Um, because this is a, not a flop I need to see that all the time. Um, and I just made the pot enormous, basically, and played this huge pot. Oh, so now I'm back down to like 350K, which is about 25 big blinds with blinds going up. And definitely manageable, but uh, a mistake by me to have made the pot so big. Ugh, or letting the pot get that big. So I'm just trying to shake it off on break, head back in there. Then we get down to 18 players and we redraw once again to two tables. And then I'm on the feature table with none other than my arch nemesis, Clyde. I was super card and spot dead and I got short and Clyde raced on the button and I shoved with king nine suited and guess what he had? Ace king, son of a gun! Clyde knocks me out of the WCPC main event in 11th place, for which I got $6,200. So that was it for poker in Aruba, and I had such a great experience. I learned so much, and one of the things that I learned is like stories that I make up about what is cool, like getting a ring or 
you know, being graceful in the ocean, but really it's just about enjoying the water and it's about making the best decisions that you can and letting the results come where they may. And you know, it's okay to just, to everyone be, <laughs> you're just like, you know, just get in there and have fun, do your best and keep learning. That's like the lesson I have to learn over and over again. And also congratulations to Richard Tromanley for winning the title. And thank you so much to Yarmir and Mark, Charlie, you guys, oh my gosh. Thank you so much. I can't wait for WSOPC Ruba next year. Uh, Ruba definitely sent us off with one of the most stunning sunsets I have ever, ever seen. So I'll share that with you guys and I'll catch you next time.